Hello, this vlog is about reading um, and perhaps the discussion of why it's good for you and why you should do it. Um, for anyone who doesn't already know, this last year I set myself a book reading challenge to read 50 books uh, in a year and I managed it. Uh, the reason why I'd set myself 50 was because the year before I'd set myself um, 45 and I actually read 47. Um, so I thought, you know, what's three more? I can I can do that. Um, and the year before that, I'd read quite a few as well. Um, and reading for me has so many benefits that I kind of wanted to share with you so that, you know, you can see what they are and see whether it's good for you also. Um, a lot of people that speak to me, uh, when they see how much I've read, they're kind of always really surprised and they're always like, how do you have the time to read? Um, they seem to think that it's like really difficult to find time to read. Um, and I think that's perhaps because a lot of people have this perception that they don't have time. And I always chuckle to myself inwardly when they say this, when they say this about anything, um, because I read, um, I didn't read, I watched a TED talk uh, talking about perceptions of time and every time someone says that I'm brought back to that TED talk and I'll put it in the in the link at the bottom um, of this so that you can watch it if you're interested but what it was kind of suggesting was that you do have time you have lots of time you know if you were to count up how many hours of time you have in a week in a month you have a lot of time and even if you take off the time that you spend, um, you know, sleeping, you know, washing up and doing chores and, and looking after yourself, whatever it is, you will still have a lot of time. Um, we kind of like have this perception that like an hour, because it's just one hour, it's not a long time, but it is, it's, it's quite a lengthy amount of time to kind of do something. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and also like, we kind of get slotted in, not slotted in, like constricted and contained by our perception of the week because we have like, oh, we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then it starts again Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And things tend to happen regularly on a day. So, for example, I go to a run club every Monday and every Wednesday. So, every week, I'm constantly going to those things. Um, and then, you know, if something else happens, um, so for example, I, I tried to start a martial arts class until I decked it on the floor and smashed my knee and then couldn't go anymore. Um, and so I got out of it, but I was going to go to, to that and that was going to be every Tuesday and Friday. And then I was, you know, I'd sometimes go live drawing, which is every Thursday. Um, I used to go to basketball every Thursday. Climbing's generally supposed to be every Sunday, but again, I don't go to that anymore. Um, I volunteering every Saturday. Saturday or it used to be every Thursday that like you get kind of locked into this repetition of things that everything happens like once every week in that time slot and so you don't kind of think to yourself I could use that time for something else and that if I viewed my week as like bi-weekly so for example on one of the Mondays I'll go run in and on one of the Mondays I'll do something else and kind of switch it every two weeks like, you would still get the benefits of what you're doing, um, but you would feel like you had more time. So it's like, you have time, but because you view it as only a week, you feel like you've got limited, and what you do is you allocate that time to things that you want to do. Now, when people say that they don't have time to read, what that actually means is that reading isn't their priority. If reading was their priority, they would find the time to read. And that's the same for anything in life. If somebody says that they don't have time to do something, to see you, to um, go somewhere with you, to, you know, do some activity or, or to do some work or whatever it is, if someone says they do not have time, that's not the actual case. It's the same when people say that they don't have any money. They say, oh, I can't afford to do that and I can't afford to do that. They can afford to do it, but that's not their priority. That's not what they've chosen to do with their money or their time. And so our kind of culture and the way that we speak about time, the way that we speak about money, the way that we speak about other things, saying we don't have it, 
it's a lie. You do have it, but instead of just being upfront and honest and saying, you know, and honest with yourself, that that's not my priority, I've not chosen to spend my time doing that, I've not chosen to spend my time reading, um, they say that they don't have time for it. And so it always makes me laugh when people say they don't have time. I wonder why that is, why people do that. Um, is it that they're just caught in the culture and, and it's just the culture to say if you, if, you don't, if you don't have any time left over that you don't have time for it? <clears throat> or is it that, you know, in our society it's viewed that reading is a good thing, it does benefit you, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, so in order to kind of make ourselves feel better about the fact that we don't do it, that we, that we say um, we don't have time for it and then that's a valid excuse for not doing it, and in reality, you know, if you prioritise, you would have you would have the time to do it. Um, so the the bottom line of this of this discussion is that you do have time. You just have to make priority and 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 replace other things in your life with it. And it doesn't have to be a complete replacement. It can be like you know, instead of spending, you know, a lot of people, the reason they don't feel like they have time to do things is because they spend an inordinate amount of time watching television or watching films. You know, a film takes about three hours of your time, maybe two and a half hours, two hours. Um, watching a TV series, you know, if you watch one episode, that's an hour. If you watch a few episodes at a time, that's multiple hours. Like, you waste a lot of time sitting passively in front of a television screen, which provides you with very little intellectual stimulation. It's a kind of, you sit there to kind of not think about anything. And I know a lot of people do that and find that quite relaxing, but that it's making me feel touchy just thinking about it. I hate that. I hate sitting there passively, not thinking about stuff. Like, I enjoy thinking about things and I, I enjoy looking at new things and, and, and having an opinion about that because I feel myself growing. If I sit there passively, I feel like I'm stagnating. I feel like, you know, I could be doing something productive with my time. Even, you know, I can meditate. I can sit there and do nothing. But meditation is is, is an active way of relaxing. So you are doing something to do nothing. You're choosing to do that. Well, is that not the same? No, because it's be, uh, sitting in front of a TV doing nothing, I, it, it drives me insane. Which is why I can only watch things that, that draw me in in some kind of way, even emotionally or intellectually. It doesn't have to be intellectual. I can watch Grey's Anatomy and... And, and be emotionally drawn to it although they do talk a lot about medical terms and stuff so I'm learning stuff as I'm watching it um, so anyway you waste a lot of time watching television basically um, whereas when you when you read a book you actually learn stuff and you it changes your thinking it's a real good benefit of of reading is that the person I am right now and the person I was a hundred books ago is completely different the way that I think about things the way that I process information, the way that I communicate with people, the way that I am around other people is completely different, the way that I am at work, completely different. Um, and it's a wonder, isn't it, like, if you read another book, what impact is that going to have on you? How is that going to allow you to, to consolidate all the information that you've got from other sources um, into it? You know, a lot of the books that I read are, are, are very different things. So, I mean, when I first started reading, which, you know, when I was younger, I didn't really read that much because I was very bad at reading. I was very slow to read and I have a lot of issues with my phonological loop, which is like um, a cognitive mental concept of, of, of how you process words and things like that. Um, and I find words that require um, you to interpret phonemes, so sounds of words, very difficult, so words that have kind of uh, vowels in I find very difficult to spell or to um, like pronounce. <clears throat> I got very confused with homophones when I was younger. <coughs> so for example, the difference between where, where and where, there, there and there, they, they all sound the same to me. Um, unless you like that, like you proper enunciate it like it's, like my accent doesn't accommodate for homophones. <laughs> Um, so I always find those very difficult. But any words like um, that had were very complicated words with lots of consonants in. So a lot of like scientific terminology and and like like think like names of the brain. Like I don't know, um, gynecephalic or like which is the, the surface fold of the brain. Or you know any kind of like thalamus and I mean these aren't really hard to spell. But I'm trying to I can't think of one that's really hard to spell. But I can spell all the really difficult words. 
but I couldn't really spell the easy ones because the way that they sounded. So orthographically, I could post information, which is the way it looks. But if it was phonemes, I was just, my phonological leap was a bit dodgy. Uh, which meant that when I was reading, I found it quite difficult to kind of learn how to pronounce a lot of the words. Um, and my my parents didn't, you know, from my memory, which is not very great, but from my memory, my parents didn't really sit and read with me very often. My mum used to get really frustrated that we couldn't read and... Um, I'd often read on my own and have to go, on, go to them and ask what does this word mean if I didn't know but a lot of the time I would be reading without knowing if I was reading it right or not. Um, so because I was a very slow reader I didn't really read very much. I remember in, in year six um, being told by the teacher that if I could read the Anne Frank diary that I'd get um, five house points or ten house points or something and I never finished it because it just took me forever and it was quite a big book for like a ten year old to read. Um, but, you know, I always had books in the house. I had loads of books as a child. And I would read bits of them, but because I just couldn't read very well, I just didn't, because um, it was just such an effort. And I wasn't really enjoying it, because I didn't really, you know, know if I was getting it right and stuff. Um, and it was only in, like, year seven when the English teacher put on um, Stephen Fried's narration of Harry Potter, and I'd never read Harry Potter before. We used to sit there with the book and just listen to the tape. Excellent teacher, Mrs Holden. Not... Um, but anyway, it, I, I loved Harry Potter. I, I then rented, rented, loaned the books from the library at school for the second and third one. This was before the fourth one even came out, before everybody knew about it, before the films came out. Um, so I was there loving Harry Potter. And my friend at the time used to read Point of Horror books and uh, and, uh, and Goosebumps books, and my dad used to get them from the car boot and stuff. And so when I went to the library in Chorley, I used to just rent out those Goosebumps books and Point Horror books and she'd lend me loads as well. So then I, that's when I started reading loads. Um, and, and then half of my degree is in English literature. So I went to university and studied, you know, Victorian literature and, uh, and kind of all the kind of, the, the canon of English literature, a lot of Shakespeare and, you know, I've read a lot of Shakespeare in my own time and stuff as well. Um, because I love like Hamlet and I love Twelfth Night because I've, I've studied them and I understand them um, and I love poetry and um, you know different novels and things so I've you know I've read quite a lot of, of classic kind of literature um, and then we did kind of postmodern stuff as well so I kind of had a, you know a read of, of all that kind of, of, of literature um, so my kind of basis was in, in kind of novels but as I got older I started to read kind of I mean, even in the novels, like, I would read different things, like, different cultures. So, for example, I've read about people in the Middle East. I've read about, you know, a girl having her face burnt off with acid. I've read um, about kind of abuse stories. I've read um, people starving uh, in Middle East, um, like, in Kazakhstan. and No, not Kazakhstan. It's the other one that begins with... Where's Kabul? Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, one of those stands, um, around that area, um, and then, you know, I mean, I try to remember everything. Like you, look, you pick up lots of different knowledge from different stories. So, for example, I read uh, *Girl with a Pearl Earring*, and it was talking about how you mix different colours together to make paint, um, and the the way that the bristles were from animal hair. You know, you just kind of pick up lots of different knowledge from the books that you read. So you're subliminally learning things without meaning to, as you would in kind of other ways, like, you know, like what um, playing The Sims, I picked up lots of subliminal information from that about like what the word frugal meant and, you know, loads of other random stuff. It's the same with reading. You pick up lots of different things that you, you wouldn't have come across in, in everyday life and speech um, and conversations with people. So you kind of just like learn a lot of stuff. You, you learn as well, like how to to be empathetic with people because you understand how different people think um, and feel about things based on how the characters react because they're always like very different. Um, so you kind of pick that kind of stuff up as well. So it improves your emotional health, intelligence a bit. You kind of learn kind of like how people respond to certain situations and what works and what doesn't. So you pick up a lot in that sense also. You kind of understand yourself a lot more because you see characters which are quite self-reflective and you think about well, how right I've behaved in that, in that situation and whatever. Um, but then since then, getting older, this is the point I was trying to move on to, is that I've kind of read books on physics and quantum physics. I've read books on sociology, on philosophy. You know, I've read classic Greek um, texts like Aristotle, Plato, 
um, red cat Socrates kind of red stuff uh, to do Greek mythology of red kind of I tried to read the Quran um, that didn't go so well um, you know red red parts of the Bible of red um, kind of like Eastern philosophy books of red spiritual books read books on on like self-help books memoirs written by people with psychiatric disorders read books about the mind and how the brain works i've read books on um other autobiographies from comedians and, and people like you know like adventure people um who've experienced kind of climbing up everest and um you know read so many different things read so like like um like, I don't know if you've heard of Malcolm Gladwell, but he, he talks about things in society um, and statistics, you know, to do with, like, I can't even explain, like, what it's about, like, why some people become very su successful and others don't based on, on the climate at the time. So, for example, a lot of people were successful um, in computing when there was the whole climate, climate of computers, like the computer revolution in the 1980s. Because of that, that's what made like Steve Jobs become so successful and, and whatever and if he hadn't have had that kind of climate he might not have, have got the breaks that he got and got as successful as he did so it's kind of like you know books like that they just kind of enrich your your thinking in so many different ways and as well it kind of it makes you reflect on your own thinking about how you're thinking about things and you know but I've been reading a lot of books recently about like about the mind and about your own thoughts and about how your own thoughts can create your own problems about how your perception of reality is very different to everybody else's perception of reality and that's what causes conflict in social groups and what to do about that i've been reading about how um your childhood has kind of really caused you a lot of issues in terms of being an adult and how as an adult you're on this path to kind of undo all the negativity that's created you into the, like create the problems that you've got like trying to figure out like how to address all that and to remove those automatic responses that you've got that you've learned in childhood but you try to undo as an adult because you realize that they're, they're not good for you and they're irrational and all the rest of it um so you it really really like catapults you into self-development you end up on a path far ahead of the people that are around you you know when i look around at people that i'm friends with their thinking's very much how my thinking used to be five years ago and my thinking seems to have progressed onwards i seem to have changed a lot as a person in based on, on what i'm reading i'm growing i'm getting to somewhere and a lot of you know even people that i know that are a lot older than me are still kind of not at the point where i'm at in terms of understanding their own thoughts and, and what they're doing and their own behavior and things so it's it's very interesting that by reading so much you can you can develop so much in such a short amount of time reading also kind of um it allows you to connect with other people you have a lot more to talk about a lot more to say for yourself a lot more to kind of um add to a conversation you can make conversations a little bit more interesting a little less benign you know you don't have to ask about people's days and, and weeks and what they've done which is like the standard small talk you don't have to have small talk unless you want to you can talk about other things I mean the only downside to that is that if you've got a shocking memory like I have <laughs> I can never remember what I've read anyway so I can never really have these conversations but I do attempt to you know they do come up in in, in different conversations sometimes and I'll, I'll add to the conversation um so you know they can be they can be good for that um Reading's really good as an escape as well. You know, reading kind of stops you from overthinking, like, things that don't really matter. You know, like, overanalyzing your day and overanalyzing what someone said and what you said and how you reacted and how they reacted. It's unnecessary. Like, you don't need to be done. Like, just forget it and move on. But you need to fill your brain with something else. Like, trying to stop yourself from thinking about something doesn't work because you're trying to remove something and your brain's got nothing left in there but if you read you fill in your head with stuff so it's still got something to do but it's more healthy for you because you're not thinking about banal so things like you've got to kind of fill your mind with something else um otherwise it just won't stop thinking about all that kind of stuff that's you know not needed to be thought about so by reading it kind of 
gives you gives your brain like a toy to play with. It kind of gives it something to work with. Um, the brain likes to be active. It likes to be doing things all the time, and you can have control over that by giving it something. You know, being being nice to it, occupying it. You know, treat your mind like a little child. Like you can't sit in a room with nothing to do. It might um, kind of come up with something of itself to kind of occupy itself with but it would be like sticking its fingers in the plug sockets and like tipping things over and that's what your brain does it kind of starts destroying kind of what's in there unintentionally but just for something to do so by giving it kind of some information to mull over something to kind of think about something to have a conversation with someone else about it's giving it something to do it's preoccupying it so that it doesn't become self-destructive which is you know a lot of the problems that people have is that they overthink things they think far too much about stuff um that doesn't need to be thought about so essentially to conclude this vlog reading you do have time for it if you make the time for it it improves your vocabulary it improves your ability to communicate with other people it improves your ability to to resonate more with other people and to get closer to people it gives you more interesting conversations to have it helps you mentally because it replaces all the kind of negative thinking about your life with actually actively thinking about you know something else some kind of topic and mulling that over instead so you become a lot calmer a lot kind of more able to be in the moment rather than thinking about the future or the past because you're just simply analysing the information that you've read and thinking about it. It allows you to consolidate information better, it allows you to process information quicker, to evaluate it for bias, it allows you to make decisions in the future that are a bit more informed. Um, and so it's so beneficial to you. It changes your thinking, it helps you grow. I mean, why wouldn't you want to make time for it? Like, you know, you stood up waiting for your tea to, to cook, get a book out, read a page. That's what I do. A lot of people have this perception that you have to kind of like sit down for hours to read something. But in reality, you, you can slot reading into your day as it is. So for example, I, um, when I get to work and I park in the car park, it takes a good kind of like five minutes to walk from the car park into my staff room. So I get a book out and on the walk in, I could probably read like one or two pages um, or three or so pages, depending on uh, how many people are around. And a lot of people say to me like, I don't know how you read and walk at the same time, like I'd walk into stuff or whatever. Um, and you've, I mean, you've got to kind of like understand that your body and your brain are an amazing thing and that if you just trust yourself like it will work for you so for example like when I'm reading like half my attention is on the reading but half of my attention is in my periphery and you have the ability to spot things that are in your periphery and to process that information so that you don't walk into things so for example I'll be reading and I'll be engaged in the book, but I'll be able to see things in my periphery and be able to move around them as I'm reading. Like my, my reading speed is a bit slower than usual, but you know, I still have that ability to do it because you know, your brain has two streams that it processes information. There's the dorsal and the ventral stream, and one of them's a lot faster and immediate than the other one. So the, the, you know, the, the one of the streams is processing all the information in your, in your periphery and you know, for threats and things, and it will automatically go through and alert you if there is something in your environment but only if you trust it um i know an example of this would be i go to or go to i've been to um an animal class that my friend does and it's really really cool it's like um you know you do animal movements and you exercise in ways that you don't realize like you're using muscles that you don't realize you're using so it's a really cool class and it's in the dark and the, th the thing that we do at the end is you close your eyes and you kind of move around the room um, without opening your eyes and you have to kind of trust your intuition to kind of navigate and there were times where I'd got to the edge of this platform it must have been about this big from the floor so I could have fallen off it but my body stopped myself and I, I felt the edge with my hand it's almost like I knew that that was the edge 
like my unconscious mind knew that that was the edge and it stopped me because I trusted it. It's like when you go to kind of like the traffic centre and you park your car and then you come back and you, you don't really know where your car is. Like if you just kind of walk around and trust your intuition, you will come to your car because your unconscious mind knows where it is. It's just your conscious mind that doesn't. So you have to kind of just trust your unconscious mind to let it guide you and, and be intuitive about it. Whereas if you're kind of thinking so much about something that it will it will engulf your your kind of your reading, you'll not be able to read as you're walking or whatever, you'll not be able to listen to the same as anything in life. If you think too much about things you you won't be able to hear your intuition. But that's for another vlog. Um so you can read and walk at the same time and your brain is is amazing. It has plasticity it kind of, um, it adapts with response to information that's inputted into your mind um, and changes shape. So for example, there was this study by Maguire that looked at London taxi drivers. And London taxi drivers have to do what's called the knowledge, which is they've got to know kind of like 25,000 streets within a five mile radius of Charing Cross and they need to know everything that's on these streets, like points of interest. So if you get in a black cab in London, they know exactly where they're going. There's no sat house in their cars. Um, and so the, they did brain scans and found that the posterior hippocampus was a lot larger and the anterior was a lot smaller, so it, the grey matter had redistributed um, in people that had been taxi drivers for longer. So it shows that the, the brain was responding to that, that input um, and, and changing shape because the posterior hippocampi is, is correlationally found that it's for, for spatial maps. So for spatial navigation, that part of the brain needs to be larger. And you can't just create matter out of nothing. So they've taken it from the anterior and put it in the posterior so that it can do that kind of task. So, you know, the more that you that you read, it's changing your brain all the time. You know, when you're walking, reading, you'll get better at it. Um, so, you know, what you feed into your mind changes it and makes it how it ends up. So you want to feed it with lots of stuff and then, and then it can specialise and you can become really good at things. Um, but, you know, trying to fit in reading in your day already is probably the first step to trying to improve reading. You know, you don't, you don't have to read a full chapter, you can just read a couple of pages, you know, and you'll find that you remember what you've read because it just comes back to you when you scan over the page again. So, you know, like, like I said, so I read, like, on my way into work, I read on the way out of work. I read between, so leaving the staff room, going to my classroom, I read there, so I read a page there. Uh, when I get home, um, I might sit down for half an hour and read, but not for a really long time. Like, the only time I tend to read for long lengths of time is at the weekend if I'm not doing anything, and that's rare as well. So, you know, I'm no different to you. Like, I have the same amount of time as you have. I'm very busy. Like, I have a lot of hobbies and a lot of friends that I see. Um, you know, so I'm always kind of doing stuff with my time. It's not like I don't, you know, like do anything and that's why I've got time to read. Like I'm really active, but yet I still read 50 books in a year. So if I can do it, like you can too. It's just about being efficient with your time and not making excuses and not kind of saying, oh, I don't have time. Like you do have time. It's just you'd rather sit in front of a TV for five hours every day, passively, not thinking, switching off. Like, you know, sometimes switching off is uh, is not a benefit. It's switching off stagnates you. You stay the same forever. You just relive the same thing over and over again. And you never experience kind of actually living and growing. You know, a plant, a plant doesn't stay the same forever. It grows each year. And so if you're not growing each year with what you're doing, then, you know, you're not living. So, read a book. <laughs>